Hello students, so this is Vibha Parekh and today we are going to discuss few of the JE advanced question from chemistry subject. Let's see the question and their respective solutions. So the first question that we have is this one, the major product of the following reaction sequences. So this is the compound being given to us. So first of all, let us identify the compound and the functional group. So here you may see we have this kind of functionality. On one side, we have aryl group. Then we have a carbonyl compound, carbonyl group. And on the another side of carbonyl group, we have an alkyl group. So what kind of uh, functional group is this? So this is a ketonic functional group. Okay, this is a ketonic functional group. That means a carbonyl compound. And the reagents that are being given to us in the first step are HCHO. That means formaldehyde being taken into excess in the basic medium and and then it's been heated. This will give us a certain compound which when being treated with HCHO once again in the acidic medium and catalytic amount is going to give us some product. We need to identify whether this is A, B, C or D. Okay. So let us just try to understand the question first. Uh, we, al uh, we already discussed uh, what uh, reactant and reagents we have. But what is going to happen in this case? Let's try to go more in details. So first of all, we have a ketone as the reactant and uh, the reagent being given to us is HCHO, okay, which is again a formaldehyde that means an aldehyde. So whenever you see two carbonyl compounds being reacted with each other, the first thing that should come to your mind is that whether this could be an aldol condensation. Okay, and we know that in order for a reaction to be aldol condensation, at least one of your carbonyl compound has alpha hydrogen present in it. Okay, so do you see any of the alpha hydrogen in any of this molecule? So we have this as the HCHO. So definitely in formaldehyde, there is no alpha hydrogen because there is no alpha carbon. The hydrogen present on alpha carbon is called as alpha hydrogen. But since there is no alpha carbon, so that means no alpha hydrogen is present. But do we have any alpha hydrogen in this molecule? So yes, in this at this portion, of course, there is no hydrogen. But this position, which is an alpha carbon, possesses one hydrogen. So that means aldol condensation can take place. Okay, so the first step will be uh, related to aldol condensation. So let us see um, how this it should be done okay so i'm first of all making this molecule over here so this is your benzene ring benzene ring and then we have this carbonyl group then we have this isopropyl group okay also we have hydrogen over here so first of all in the basic medium since we know that bases are the substances or the uh, bases are the substances that can abstract hydrogen okay and uh, we can see one of the very acidic hydrogen over here so this OH negative is going to take away this hydrogen with it and leaving behind a negative charge this negative charge would be in resonance with this carbonyl compound and the compound that I will get out of this would be this molecule so this is co then comes a negative charge over here and the two alkyl groups is that clear okay so now we have this another molecule which is hcho which is formaldehyde so you know that aldol condensation is going to take place here so this these two steps that i am discussing over here are nothing but the aldol condensation okay this is nothing but the aldol condensation so if you directly know what is the product of aldol condensation you may directly write down the product as well uh, here i'm giving you a little bit of mechanism okay so when this negative charge attacks on this carbon why this carbon because this carbon is very very electrophilic because it's been bonded with a doubly uh, bonded oxygen oxygen itself is very electronegative as well as there is a double bond which makes this carbon quite very electropositive so that's why this negative charge will be attacking on this electron deficient carbon atom and this will lead to a compound let's see what compound will be formed here so this is my benzene this is carbonyl compound nothing is going to happen here then this negative charge attacks on this oxygen and this will lead uh, the bond to shift over oxygen and oxygen gets a negative charge is this clear but again this uh, molecule will not survive in this way because oxygen having a negative charge is of course not a stable form so, of course, there will be some hydrolysis being taking place here and this will result into CO and alkyl group and this one OH. Okay, so you know that what's the name of this compound because this is an aldol product. So, this has to be alpha and beta. At beta position, you would be having a hydroxy group a beta with respect to ketone. So, this is actually beta hydroxy ketone beta hydroxy ketone and this is nothing but a aldol product is this clear 
Okay, so this is one of the steps that we have followed. But since in the question you can see the HCHO was being taken into access, it means that I can utilize more formaldehyde for the first step itself. Okay, so see here, if I move on to the, uh, if I take one more molecule of HCHO, let's see what will happen. So this is your another molecule of HCHO, that means formaldehyde. Okay, but now let's see that whether more aldol condensation can occur here or not. See here, in this newly made molecule, there is no alpha hydrogen. This one is the alpha carbon and I cannot see any of the hydrogen. And also in this formaldehyde, there is no alpha hydrogen. When you don't have alpha hydrogen, if there is no alpha hydrogens, but you have two different uh, carbonyl compounds, then also there is one very famous reaction you must have heard of. This is Kenizaro reaction would take place. This Kenizaro reaction is a kind of disproportionation reaction. Disproportionation reaction. It means that one of the molecule would be uh, oxidized to acid and the another would be reduced to base. Okay. So how this reaction takes place? Let me give you a very simple idea. So you have your medium as OH negative. When this OH negative attacks on this um, formaldehyde molecule, this will lead the bond to shift to oxygen. Oxygen getting a negative charge will again come back to its position. Once again, I'm just giving you this whole thing in a one single step because this is not needed. You directly need your answer. So when this charge again comes back, then the hydrogen here will actually attack to the electron efficient carbon of the another carbonyl compound okay so i'm directly making this molecule over here because uh, i'm very sure you must be having the idea how to do kenizaro reaction and the products related to it so this will lead to this product which is o negative okay this is your hydrogen this is your uh, two alkyl groups on the methylene carbon and this one is OH and also this HCHO which was formaldehyde this has changed into HCOOH okay is that clear but since they are present in the uh, aqueous medium so of course this hydrogen will actually go over there and will form the alcohol okay and will survive in the form of carboxylate ion okay so this itself will become hcoo minus we don't have to do anything with this so uh, we have a more important role of this another molecule which is oh this is your carbon having two alkyl groups and this one oh okay so this is a molecule that i have obtained from the step number one from here the step number one is done and now i have to do or i have to utilize the reagents from the step number two Okay, so you may just write down this molecule that you have got out of the step number one. So from step number one, I got the compound, which is benzene, this carbon holding OH, this carbon holding two alkyl groups and the another OH. Okay, now from the second one, which is HCHO once again, but this time it is present in catalytic amount also in acidic medium. So let's see what I can make out of it. Okay, so now I have my medium as acidic. Okay, this is acidic medium. Now this is step number two, just remember. So since this is H plus, so definitely oxygen holding lone pair is going to give away its electrons to this hydrogen. Am I right? Because oxygen is having more lone pair, which can be easily given to H plus ion. And this will lead to, okay, one more thing, not this oxygen. You will have to decide that which, which oxygen is going to give away its two electron. Or the lone pair. See, there are two possibilities. We have two hydroxy groups. So I have to see which one should be giving its electron to H plus. If I give, if this particular OH, this one, let me highlight, if this OH gives its electron to hydrogen, so there is a benefit that it will be getting a positive charge, that means a carbocation. And this carbocation would be a benzyl carbocation, which will be resonance stabilized. So I think among these two OH, this one is that OH which is going to give a better stable carbocation cationic state okay and that's the reason that why i will in h plus medium or in the acidic medium this oxygen will give away its electron and will get a positive charge over here and this will lead to this molecule which is oh now as i said what's the benefit because when this oh2 positive leaves this will lead to a carbocation cation state which is a benzyl carbocation and very much stable Okay, so this is the carbocation I will get out of this molecule, this holding a positive charge and OH. I'm talking of this carbon, 
and this carbocation which is a benzyl carbocation and it's very stable let me just write it over here so that you remember this is a benzyl carbocation and it's resonance stabilized and that's the reason that why this carbocation is formed it's resonance stabilized okay now since this has been formed now what's the next step of course this is not my product okay i again have one more hcho molecule which is present in catalytic amount so how can i use this molecule actually when you just add this hcho let me write this hcho in this manner so that i can just show you the diagram more clearly so again this is hcho this particular carbon is very very electron deficient being present uh, with a doubly bonded oxygen this carbon is very electron deficient so that's why the lone pairs which are present on this oxygen of alcohol they will just try to help this carbon giving their electrons away okay and this will lead the double bond to shift to oxygen atom and because of this this oxygen which is negatively charged is going to attack over this carbocation so that the positive charge can be stabilized am i right and because of all these steps at the end the molecule that i will get would be something like this Okay, so this is my, you can just draw it in a better way if you want or dry, try drawing yourself, drawing yourself so that you can have a better and clear idea. And this is the carbon holding two hydrogens. Okay, but still I can see because this oxygen has given away to it, of its electron to um, the, uh, the carbonyl carbon, that's why this oxygen gets a uh, positive charge and when the full workup will be done and the hydrolysis will be done then you know that this hydrogen will go away and the final product that you will get out of these two steps would be a acetal kind of product okay you may see here so this is the molecule that should i get as the product i know that this question was quite very lengthy but this is how it's going to take place in a very systematic manner so let's see that what is this um, molecule among the options. So the first option that I can see is exactly the similar uh, product that I received from my steps. So I guess you have understood the question number one. So we have one more question that we will be discussing just now. Okay, so let's see the question number two, which is consider the following list of reagents. Some of the reagents have been given to you, that is acidified potassium dichromate, alkaline potassium permanganate, uh, copper sulfate, then hydrogen peroxide, chlorine, ozone, then FeCl3, HNO3, that is nitric acid and Na2S2O3. Okay, so these are some of the reagents being given to you. You need to say that the total number of reagents that can oxidize, okay, so they should be like oxidizing agent in order to oxidize oxidized iodide to iodine so we have this as the iodide and we need to convert this into iodine so if you have to make this kind of conversion then what oxidizing agents i may use among all these reagents um, this is the question okay so first of all let us verify whether this is an oxidation reaction or not see here it's a kind of redox reaction like uh, you can just go with the oxidation states so you can see that iodine over here is in the minus one oxidation state and any of the element which is present in its elemental state like for iodine it's a iodine molecule so for that its oxidation state is being considered as zero so since my uh, sub, uh like uh, you can see this ion is changing from minus one to zero oxidation state so of course it's been done by losing electrons okay since there is a loss of electron i can consider this as a oxidation process and oxidation has always been carried out in the presence of an oxidizing agent so among all these reagents i need to um, confirm that which one is my oxidizing agent so i just want to give you few of the points related to an oxidizing agent Although after that, I will also give you the chemical equations uh, that help you to understand how this oxidation process is being taking place. Okay, so first of all, what is an oxidizing agent? Oxidizing agent is an agent, of course. So agent is someone who uh, does work for somebody else, right? So in the same way, this is an agent that oxidizes others. What it does? It oxidizes others. So since it's oxidizing others, so in the other way, we may also say that it reduces itself. It reduces itself. That means it itself takes away the electron and it, uh, it oxidizes other. It means that it takes out electron from other species. 
Is that clear? Okay. One more thing. What are those species that can act like a oxidizing agent? So there could be many different kinds of species, but some of the common things that I can actually discuss with you are that if the central atom in your reagent is already in its highest oxidation state, so it will always be in the tendency to take some electrons so that it can have a lower oxidation state. So that reagent you may consider as an oxidizing agent. Secondly, if your reagent can produce nascent oxygen, nascent oxygen is a single atom oxygen. Normally, your oxygen exists as an oxygen molecule. But if it is present just in a single monoatomic species, it is called as nascent oxygen. And you write it like this. Okay. Uh, and the third one is that if, can, if it can deliver, if it can deliver either oxygen atom to another uh, compound or some electronegative atoms, if it can add to a certain another species, you again, you may consider this as a oxidizing agent. If it has a tendency to take away H plus ion from the another species, again, you will consider this as a oxidizing agent. And some of your bases are also oxidizing in nature. Okay, so this is simple understanding you may, you should have if you are going to attempt this question. Now, let me tell you how these reagents and how will you decide whether these reagents are oxidizing or not. Okay, so let's take all of them one by one. So let us first of all talk about acidified K2Cr2O7. So first one is acidified K2Cr2O7. Okay, so first of all, if I ask you to find out the chromium oxidation state, so chromium is in what oxidation state? So you can actually find it out, but it is in plus six oxidation state. How is this being done? Let me show you. So see here, potassium is plus one because it belongs to group number one. So it has to be always in plus one oxidation state and there are two potassium. So that's why two multiplied by plus one. Uh, we need to find out what is the oxidation state for chromium. So that's why I'm taking this as X and oxygen because it's present, um, it's more electronegative element. So it will always be present in uh, minus two oxidation state and the overall molecule is neutral. So that's why zero. Clear? So 2 plus 2x and minus 14 is equal to 0. So that means 2x would be equal to minus 12. 12 will go on the other side. So this will become plus 12 and x comes out to be as plus 6. It means that both the chromium atoms here are present in plus 6 oxidation state, which is actually the highest oxidation state possible for chromium. And that's why chromium always in this desire to take some electrons so that it can have a lower oxidation state like plus three. Okay. So your chromium wants to go from plus six to plus three oxidation state. And that's why since it takes electron, it reduces itself. And on the other way, it will be oxidizing another one. So it may act like a oxidizing agent and not just oxidizing agent acidified K2Cr2O7 is a very, very strong oxidizing agent. Now, let me show you how the chemical equation can be written with respect to acidified K2Cr2O7. So, the reaction would be something like this, K2Cr2O7, which is acidified, that means H2SO4 is present here, uh, providing the acidic medium. This reacts with your potassium iodide. So, this converts it into 4K2SO4, so which is the salt plus chromium sulfate, which is CrSO4 whole thrice, plus iodine. This is the uh, thing that we wanted out of this equation. So, and plus molecules of water. Okay. So here in this equation, I may see my iodine was in minus one oxidation state. Now this converted to zero. So that means it's been oxidized. And at the same time, your chromium was in plus six oxidation state and this has changed to plus three oxidation state. So I may say that this is reduced. Okay. And this one is oxidized. So the, the thing or the species that is actually reduced in a process always acts like an oxidizing agent. So certainly I can use acidified K2Cr2O7 as an oxidizing agent in order to carry out this change from iodide to iodine. So yes, this one is the answer. Now my second molecule is which one? Second reagent is alkaline KMnO4. So let's see how this will uh, do oxidation. So this is alkaline KMNO4. Again, you have to say the same thing. So 
manganese here is in plus seven oxidation state. Now you make it just use the same method and can find out the oxidation state of manganese. So actually manganese is again in its highest oxidation state and this can change into plus four or plus two which are the lower oxidation states. So by changing into the lower oxidation state it's taking up the electrons okay uh, oxidation state so this is taking up the electron that means reducing itself and in the another way we may say it is going to oxidize the other species okay so now let me show you the reaction so the reaction would occur in this way 2 kmno4 two moles of kmno4 will react with potassium iodide and water to give kio3 which is potassium iodate and two moles of manganese oxide and two moles of potassium hydroxide. Exactly in the similar way, you have to see where oxidation is being taking place and where reduction is being taking place. So this is your Mn in plus seven. And here, if you see, this will be plus four. So plus seven to plus four is what reduction. So it's reducing and that's why it will behave like an oxidizing agent. That means it will reduce itself, it will oxidize the other species. Again, here we have iodine. Uh, sorry, I, I just made this arrow in a wrong manner. So this arrow would be like between these two species, right? So this is my iodine, okay? Iodide, so this is in minus one oxidation state. And here the iodine is in higher oxidation state. So it's actually getting oxidized. Okay, similarly, you can do for iodine as well. So yes, again, your alkaline KMnO4 is going to oxidize this molecule. So now let's see the third reagent. Which one is the third reagent? This is your copper sulfate. Okay, so just in a similar way, you have to do this. Copper sulfate. So this is copper sulfate. What is the oxidation of state of copper sulfate here? So copper is actually in plus two oxidation state and you know that plus two from plus two it can go uh, and reduce into plus one oxidation state. Now let's see what kind of a reaction you may expect here. So it may go like this CuSO4 plus your potassium iodide. This will result into Cu2I2 which is copper iodide plus iodine molecule plus two moles of K2SO4. Okay, again you may see thus of course this reaction is possible because your copper is changing from plus two to plus one oxidation state and iodine is changing from minus one to zero oxidation state. So again this is certainly an answer. Okay, then which one is my fourth uh, reagent that is after CuSO4 it's H2O2 which is hydrogen peroxide. So this is your hydrogen peroxide. Again your hydrogen peroxide is a very good oxidizing agent because it can change into water molecule and oxygen. Okay so since it can change to water molecule by changing into water molecule it's actually it's actually um, removing one of its oxygen atom. So in this way it's reducing itself so it may behave like an oxidizing agent. Okay now let's see how the reaction will take place. So the reaction goes like this. So you have uh, two moles of Ki which is potassium iodide which you when react with H2O2 will give you two moles of potassium hydroxide plus iodine, okay? So in this way, you may see that yes, your iodide is being changing into iodine when it was being treated with H2O2. So yes, H2O2 is again a good oxidizing agent that may carry out this process of conversion, okay? Now the next molecule after H2O2 is Cl2. Again, Cl2 is a very good oxidizing agent. Why is this a good oxidizing agent? Let's try to understand. So Cl2, when it is in Cl2 form, so it's in zero oxidation state because this is the elemental state of chlorine. But chlorine itself is a very electronegative atom, right? So it's always in the tendency to change into Cl minus. It can easily leave in the form of Cl minus. So that means it's going from zero oxidation state to minus one oxidation state, which says that this, uh, this is reducing itself. So again, it can behave like an oxidizing agent and can carry out the oxidation of iodine iodide to iodine okay so let's see how this reaction will take place with that of iodine so here you may take two moles of potassium iodide which when reacts with chlorine will give you two moles of kcl plus iodine okay this is how it will take place so again let's see the change in oxidation state it is minus one and it's changing into zero that means it's oxidizing 
right? Cl2 is in zero oxidation state and just changing into minus one. So this is what, this is a reduction process. And that's why it behaves like a very good oxidizing agent and can easily carry out this conversion. Okay, so after five, let's see which one is the sixth one. So this one is the ozone this time. So ozone, you might be knowing ozone is a very, very good oxidizing agent. Okay, so this is my sixth one. This is ozone. Why it's a good oxidizing agent? Because ozone is very unstable, especially at troposphere. So it may easily get converted to oxygen molecule and a nascent oxygen. And I told you earlier, if your molecules see here, I told you, if there is any species that can produce nascent oxygen, it will always behave like a good oxidizing agent. And this is the reason that, that why ozone also behaves like a good oxidizing agent because it can supply this oxygen to the another species. And the reaction will go in this way 2Ki plus O3 with reaction in presence of water will lead to 2 moles of KOH plus iodine molecule and plus oxygen molecule. Now let's see whether there is actually some oxidation state being changing here. So this is minus one oxidation state of iodide and zero oxidation state of iodine. So that means it's a oxidation process going over here. Okay. And also you may see that your ozone is changing into OH minus. So that says that it's been reducing and that's why it behaves like a good oxidizing agent. Okay, so I hope this point is clear to you. Then after ozone, we have this another molecule, which is FeCl3, okay, which is what iron chloride, okay, and this is ferric chloride, actually. So you may see ferric chloride. So this one is ferric chloride FeCl3. See here, Fe is in plus three oxidation state. And you know that Fe may also exist in plus two oxidation state. So if it goes from its plus three oxidation state to plus two oxidation state, then of course it will be, it will be reducing itself, right? It will be what reducing itself and hence it can behave like a good oxidizing agent and can easily carry out iodide to iodine conversion. Is that clear? Similarly, the next reagent I have is HNO3. And you might all be knowing that HNO3 is actually a very, very good oxidizing agent. Okay, this one is your eighth molecule, which is HNO3. And this is a super good oxidizing agent. So definitely, this is again going to oxidize the molecule. Okay, oxidize iodide to iodine and what's the reason behind it so for that you may actually find out the oxidation state of nitrogen in molecule um, uh, uh, nitric acid okay so no3 minus so how will you calculate the oxidation state of nitrogen so this is plus one plus x oxygen is in minus two oxidation state and there are three atoms so this will be minus two and the whole molecule is neutral so that makes x equal uh, sorry x uh, plus so this is minus six and plus one so that makes uh, this as minus five equal to zero and x becomes plus five so again you may see that nitrogen is already in its highest oxidation state when it is in the form of nitric acid so of course it may change to different various oxidation states while it oxidizes other species and reduces itself it may go to plus three oxidation state it may also go to negative of oxidation states like minus three oxidation state in this way it will be reducing itself and will oxidize others and hence will behave like a oxidizing agent and can very clearly carry out this conversion from iodide to iodine. And the last one that we have is this Na2S2O3. So let me tell you that Na2S2O3 is a reagent which is actually being utilized in order to convert in order to this Na2S2O3 is being utilized in order to convert iodine molecule to iodide. Okay, so just remember this. So this one is being used here. And again, the reason lies behind the oxidation state of sulfur, which is being used in Na2S2O3. So yes, this reagent won't carry out any kind of oxidation. Instead, it will be helpful because it reduces the species. And hence, this is not the oxidizing agent and cannot carry out this conversion from iodide to iodine. So how many reagents I have though that can carry out the conversion of iodide to iodine? So let's count them. Okay, let's count all of them. So this is the one, this is two, 
this is three, this is four, this is five, this is six, this is seven, and this is eight. So I have total eight reagents that may carry out the conversion of iodide to iodine. That means from minus one oxidation state of iodide to zero oxidation state of iodine molecule. So I guess that you have been able to understand the two questions that we have discussed about the JE advanced here in this video. And uh, I really think that this video has been, uh, has been helpful to you. And this made your um, concepts even more clear. Okay. So with this, I would like to end this session here itself. Thank you so much. Take care and goodbye. See you very soon in the next video.